Hello, everybody, and welcome to our fourth episode of 20 Something Live. As always, we have three amazing guests for you today. Sorry if I'm a little bit behind at any point during the broadcast, still recovering from an amazing Miami Music Week and Ultra Music Festival. Today on the broadcast, we have my good friend Tim Weber, who is the CEO of one of the top blogs for music discovery today, also known as goodmusicallday.com. We also have my friend Jeff Levin, who is an a &R over at Atlantic Records, in addition to working for Warner Chapel on the publishing end, and he also owns his own management company by the name of Framework Management, where he manages the artists such as Skizzy Mars, James Young, and many more. And our first guest, who's also recovering from Miami, is the publicist and actually the entrepreneur of the firm behind the publicity for Hardwell, Nikki Romero, Marquis Las Vegas. He also is a consultant for Casablanca Records, where he has recently assisted in the signings of Martin Garrix, known for Animals, Seven Lions, and The Chainsmokers. So let's bring him in right now, my good friend Justin Lubliner. Justin, how are you? I'm doing well. A little sleepy still, but happy. You Otherwise. always look so tired. Are you all right, Justin? I'm good. <laughs> I've, been, I've been getting that a lot this weekend. I'm happy, though. Everything's good. Yeah. So talk to, to, uh, tell us what life was like over the last week. Um, I'm sure that you were pulled in a million different directions in Miami. Tell us about it. You know, things were busy. Um, we had a few events down there. We had Hardwell's Revealed and Nikki's Protocol. Um, and on site, we had Hardwell, Nikki, Don Diablo, Seven Lions, Stafford Brothers, and a few others. So it was just coordinating interviews, press opportunities, doing a few marketing concepts. Um, but mostly just being on hand to do FaceTime, to be with the artists, and to show that we support them throughout Miami. So it was good. I mean, you know, I always say Miami is one big guest list issue, and, and I look after a few people on my team as well. So it was a kind of a pain sorting everybody. But, you know, being on site, being at the festival, and getting to see everybody play for the first time. Um, you know, Martin, Martin Garrix played for the first time. I got to see him, and, and it was cool. Hardwell did an amazing set. So did Nikki. Um, so we had a lot of fun. Awesome. And Justin, I know that you were really eager to tell us about how you started, and I think that's such an important element of 20-something Live, because so many people watching are interested in the beginnings of our guests. But I'm going to start first off with where you currently are, because I got to stand next to you as we watched Hardwell close Ultra Music Festival. You've been with him for a couple years now. What did it feel like to get to witness the number one DJ in the world, who is your client, close Ultra Music Festival? It, it was phenomenal. I mean, I hadn't heard a lot of the tracks. He played 90% new music, and the intro, I know we were saying together, was was amazing, the light show. And just looking behind the front of house where we were standing and seeing everybody against the fences, it seemed that no one was at a different stage. It was cool. And, you know, for me, it, it's been a lot of hard work. I started working on him as a client when I was in college um, as a junior. And You, you know, were in college? Get, yeah, I was in college. I didn't know that. Yeah, um, started working with Nikki and Hardwell when I was when I was a junior in college, and you know I was given the lucky opportunity to start somewhere low with them. Um, Hardwell likes to say with me, start from the bottom. Now we're here, um, but it, it was fun. I mean, you know, it, 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 they're the two clients that that we've been working hand in hand together since the beginning. Um, you know, when Hardwell first started with his new with his management company um, is when I came on, and I think Nikki was at seventeen thousand likes on Facebook or something. You know, low like that. So it's been a growing experience for everybody. You know, learning on on how to develop myself as a publicist and someone who handles a lot of marketing and watching their growth as well. So it's been a great relationship and easy for me to access the consumers and the fans because I grew up with them, um, having my musical taste evolve and being a fan at Ultra for the past three years. So I really get to understand what these people are feeling and go through it together with them. How do you, as a junior in college, get the attention of up-and-coming international dance music superstars like Nicky Romero and Hardwell, enough to make them your clients? It was, it was uh, you know, for me, I, I'd always wanted to be in the music industry, so I had my eyes set on a goal, um, and that was to start my own business within. And, you know, early on, I, I was doing a lot of passion projects, everything from internships to starting my own blog. And we had started a blog, you know, pretty, pretty early in the stages of online you know, media, blogging, um, so we had a great reputation for that, and I found myself in the position where I can offer something mutually beneficial to a bunch of these um, managers and agents in that I could post their artists on my website, which at the time was one of the first hype machine published um, electronic music websites. So from there, um, you know, we started managing artists, we started talking to managers, and 
at the time I realized, you know, quite early that electronic music was such a growing um, genre and that it really was just based online and a lot of the connections that we had and the ideas that we had were to grow an artist exposure online so you know utilizing the connections that we had in in management projects in the blog we kinda just created from thin air this forward-thinking fully functional digital marketing PR um, branding you know community which consisted of myself and you know leaning on a bunch of my contemporaries from USC where I went to school um, to help me with photos and videos and design concepts and just being in a very creative atmosphere um, and you know from thin air we kinda just pushed and pushed and pushed put pitch decks together we reached out to a bunch of agents and managers that we were working closely with and you know eventually you know landed Nicky Romero after you know I think four or five months of negotiation from there kinda just snowballed um, into something a bit bigger so that's kind of how we started and did they know at the time that you were only 21 years old you know they did, and and I think it was uh it it was cool because I was the same age almost as the artist, um, and you know the way I pitched it always was you have a bunch of forty five year old people reaching out to these bloggers that I'm friends with. You know these are people that we're dealing with on the day to day basis, and you know my favorite term is mutually beneficial. And I realized early on that a lot of these bloggers, in being twenty one and friends of mine, all had side projects, whether it was management, whether it was you know starting their own labels, or you know kind of building up their media firms everyone had something that they were working on the side and given you know my situation having a blog and working with artists I could offer something back to these people more than just you know, trying to convince them and pitch them all day on on doing content for my artists so you know we we approached these these management teams and artists as you know we are your target consumer we're trying to appeal to us um, my friends are the people that are going to your shows so in doing so, when we create marketing concepts and PR initiatives, we're doing something that is going to appeal to us and cater to our friends and not a, a person outside of, of this inner circle. Um, so, you know, the age meant something in that capacity that we were young and we understood this music and this generation so well. Um, but, you know, for me, I, I had some experience. I was, I was, you know, on top of my, my game, I feel like, at the time. So I, I'd, I'd like to think my age didn't matter. And do you think that it was actually an advantage based on how you just described it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the thing is, when we're living this community every day and we're living in, in a fraternity and, and in college dorms where people are blasting this music down the hall, we get a real sense of what we can do to appeal to that target demo. And that's how, how we approached it every single day until now. It's just, you know, I, I've always found myself in the midst of Ultra Music Festival, in the crowd, going from stage to stage, just, just feeling what these other people are feeling. Um, and, and trying to just appeal to, to, to friends and to people that I work closely with. Um, so in that capacity, just understanding it so well and growing up with this style of music, I think we did have an advantage of, of being so young. And when I say we, I mean me. But um, <laughs> Was it just you at the time? It, it was just me at the time. I, you know, I, I, I had some people that were interested in doing stuff together, but I found myself um, more trusting in, in my ability than the ability to work with others. Um, and... You know, just just being able to grow this project by myself was was very beneficial for me at the time. Instead of uh, placing tasks in other people's hands and such, so makes sense. Let's dig into the process a little bit of how you acquired these clients. You mentioned that you met them through agents and managers, and those were agents and managers where you already had clients that were maybe slightly smaller than Nikki and Hardwell. And then once you got the opportunity to to meet and discuss with Nikki and Hardwell's teams. How exactly did you go about pitching them? Was it a phone call? Was it an email? Was it a proposal? If so, go into a little bit of detail about what was in that proposal and how you think you won the job. Sure. So to give you some context, before I started to meet everybody, I'd worked on a number of different projects. Um, when I was 19 years old, I was in Internet Live Nation, um, and I had this blog, and I was kind of like the EDM kid in the office. And this was the time when Live Nation was just starting to book some high-profile DJs, such as Dead Mouse and Tiesto. And there wasn't really a marketing force in the office that really understood EDM too well. Um, so I was just this kind of like ADD crazy kid running around, <laughs> just chatting my mouth off. And I think some of the some of the higher ups started to pick up that there was someone in the office that was really keen to work on EDM projects. So I started getting invited into meetings with promoters and with um, marketing staff to kind of give my perspective on how I would approach certain marketing tasks. Um, and the next summer, I was I was able to land an opportunity on. Um, helping run the digital marketing and PR. Um, at the time, I didn't call it all of those things. It was just kind of helping out on Identity Festival. 
So through that, I kind of just started to, to increase my, my database and understanding this world and how to approach it from, from, an, from a young person's perspective. And, you know, for me, I've always, I've always been kind of like a sponge and taken in information. And, you know, they always say, you know, stealing from one is plagiarism, but stealing from a million or from 20 is, is smart. And that's kind of how I approached it. I'd see the pros and cons of what other people were doing. Um, and I took in all that information and, and, and tried to see what I could do that, that reached above what my competitors were doing. Um, and that, you know, having the blog and getting a lot of email addresses and, and press releases and pitches to me was a great competitive advantage because I got to see what everyone else was working on. Um, mm -hmm. So from there, I, you know, I, I utilized that and, and I started working on management clients and, you know, just started to build up ideas and, and ways to go about things. So when I was able to sit in with... Um, these agents, it wasn't because I'd worked on previous projects, but because um, I'd actually been been offered a position while I was in college at a management company, and I wasn't able to take on that position. So I was, I, I, I thought to myself, you know, I really need to push this and find a way to maintain these connections so that I don't lose the opportunities. And that's when I decided that I was going to start a, a company in college um, because I, I I couldn't work um, legally at the time. So um, you know, I, I met with these people and I approached different. The, the artist that I thought personally that I could do the, the biggest effect on at the time, I think it was Nicky Romero and, and a guy called Hook and Sling um, through an agent named Bobby Kohler who still remains a very close friend of mine and he, he liked it, he introduced me to the managers, I sat on Skype calls I think for four months back and forth trying to convince these guys to let me add a value to their team that they at the time didn't realize that they needed but I felt they did. Um, started with low fees um, on a trial three-month basis and, and really just convince them to let me get in the door because I felt that I had something to offer that no one else did. And how did you go about actually bringing that value beyond just sort of the lower-level blog world to these clients? It, it was a growing process. I mean, the blog world at the time was the main means of promotion for these DJs. Um, there wasn't Rolling Stone, there wasn't Billboard, there wasn't MTV. These all these all came later, and I had the lucky opportunity to come in before that happened, so I can grow my my you know PR ability um, to the point where when the Rolling Stones and the MTVs were available, I knew how to approach it. But for us, you know, I always said that it wasn't it, the way we like to do PR is is a manager comes to a publicist and says, "Hey, we have this marketing concept, we have this release, now get it." posted, you know, tell our story, um, do some sort of initiative that's going to get us exposure. The way that we kind of reversed that process was that we approached and said, okay, tell us what you have planned and then we're going to develop the marketing concepts, we're going to do the social media initiatives and then we're going to PR that. So we always found a different way. We used marketing to force our PR initiatives and then PR was kind of like the 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 way that we got it out to the world. But, you know, for us, with Nikki in the beginning, it was developing on his social media. Um, it was getting him on video concepts. It was, you know, sending people on tour to photograph him and doing videos that were a little outside the box, documentary series, stuff like that, that really made us stand out as publicists because we were offering more services than just PR. You know, one of the things that we started with Hardwell early on, which I get in a lot of trouble for, was we were really kind of like the first people who did like for downloads. Um, and there was a like for download that we had done around Electric Zoo 2012 where we had given away uh, this kind of like Lord of the Rings gift set of a bunch of bootlegs that we had done over the past, you know, five years, um, and, and a bunch of those were from other artists and they got a little upset. That's when we stopped doing it, but just little things that are now kind of cliche and of the norm, we, I feel like we're, we're you know, in, in the beginning, the first people on top of those. And that helped us with PR and getting things out there. You sure are a pioneer. <laughs> uh, uh, thank uh, you. Of course. So, guys, remember that you can tweet at any time to ask Justin questions. All you have to do is hashtag 20-something live, and those questions will be forwarded to me. Justin, I want to move on to your label activities in a minute. But before we do, I want to touch on one last thing of your publicity career, which is I'd love to know what you are most proud of that you've accomplished for any one of your clients. You know, it's, it's, it's honestly hard to say. Um, I, I wish I thought about this question beforehand. I feel like for me, taking on a really challenging artist and trying to build out something that's, that's visible to the EDM world was really, 
was really exciting for me. And you know, take everything that we've done for Hardwell and Nikki and Seven Lines and guys like that aside, I really like the work that we did on a smaller client that we have called the Stafford Brothers. Um, and the reason I say that is because when the Stafford Brothers came to us, you know, they were these really fun, loving, exciting Australian DJs that hadn't really hit the U.S. market yet. Um, and at the time, you know, and still today, they're known for their live set and their um, on-stage personality, but they hadn't really produced a lot of music. And it was in a period where music was in EDM specifically was transitioning from trends into um, people just genuinely going to a show to enjoy the music. Um, and and for us, it was a really difficult period to to expose artists that didn't have too much music output. Um, into something that the American demographic can really feel uh, a connection with. So what we did is we really started from the bottom. We we rebranded them. We got one of my favorite people from USC who did Alessio's logo to to do a, a complete brand restructure for them. Um, we hired this unbelievable videographer called Mikael to go on tour with them and do a video series that people can you know see their personalities and get more in depth perspective on who they are as human beings and what they are behind the stage. Um, and we developed this 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 radio show series where each week um, we placed a radio show on a different blog exclusively. And what we did is we offered these blogs, you know, front title positioning and social media, uh, reciprocal social media posts if they were to give us a um, featured blog post each week. And you know, for 45 weeks straight, I think it's been maybe even longer, we've gotten them an exclusive blog posting on a top website and, you know, every week there's been an interview, a contest, something to do with their with their career that we'd be able to promote them with. So I think for us, you know, all things set aside, all the PR stunts, I think for me to have really made a difference from a PR marketing perspective on artists that um, came into a really oversaturated marketplace and give them a name that they can stand on with their own in the EDM community has been super successful. Wow, I was going to save this one for the end, but for those that don't know, the Stafford Brothers were my former roommates. Um, they shot a music video at our house featuring Lil Wayne and Christina Milian. We also threw my great big birthday bash at the house as well with plenty of superstar DJs spinning in the building. And so, Justin, I guess it leads me into my next question, which is, are you the reason that my former house is on TMZ? Not exactly. I mean, there, I think that that's uh, Jamil Davis's um, fault, and uh, <laughs> we'll really go into many, much more details for that. But we had fun. We had a good time in the house. Cool. So, talk to me about your transition from publicist into now consulting and being an A and R over at Casablanca Records. How did that relationship begin? And talk to us about the first deal that you made. Uh, sure. So. When I was, uh, you know, kind of jam-packed in the middle of the marketing and PR situation, um, I was approached by Casablanca. Um, you know, I was introduced by Alan Gary, who at the time was Hardwell's agent, and you know, is, is an amazing agent at AM only with bingo players, DJ Snake, and more. Um, he had he had interned there 10, 10 years ago, and he had said that they were looking for someone to come on and do a lot of marketing. Um, so when I went in there, I'd sat with them and. You know, A&R has always been a passion of mine. I'd interned a number of times at, at, at record labels and, you know, had the blog we were showcasing our musical taste. So for me, I really wanted an opportunity to move away from move away from marketing and PR and really focus on that type of role. So what I'd done is I'd sat there and, and transitioned the conversation into A&R and I said, look, you know, we can work on marketing and PR initiatives together, but what I'd really like to do is is work on the opportunity to to get into more of an A and R role with you guys. I see the opportunity. You know, it's a burgeoning label. It's it's going to be really successful, in my opinion. I think I can offer a lot of talent to this label. Um, you know, we have good ears, and we think we can we can do something more. So over the next were they months, open to that right away? They they were and they weren't. I mean, you know. I feel like a lot of people come in with a similar approach, and it, for me, it was it wasn't the same type of pitch. It wasn't we can do X, Y, and Z because we did this. It was more you know give me a chance and I'll prove it to you. Um, you know, so over the next couple of weeks, we'd sent over A and R reports, artists we like, people that we'd worked on. Um, you know, set up a couple a couple remix opportunities for them. Uh, one we did was with Aston Shuffle and Dyro, and after there began to be a little success. That's when we really started to work on a relationship, which was mostly focused on A and R. Um, and the first artist we really tried to work with with was this guy called Seven Lions. And to me, Seven Lions had such an amazingly um, 
had such an amazing, innovative sound that was a bit different from stuff that was happening in electronic music, and it was more urethral and melodic and something that people can really dig their nails into. And it was also, it, it stepped a bit outside the social norms of dubstep. It was more catered to, like, you know, really um, dark-minded people, uh, more, more evanescence meets pop, that, you know, is the way I, I'd approach it. And I thought this guy had an amazing vision and look, and, and that's how I approached it. And from there, we kind of just tried to do a bunch of trial situations. We signed one of his tracks called Strangers to a movie. Um, I forget what the movie is called. Um, and really worked our place in, in that artist's career before we signed the, the first artist deal. Um, so that was really exciting. With Martin Garrix, it was a bit, it was a bit more spontaneous. Um, I'd actually found a video of him on Facebook tagging himself on um, one of Hardwell's management team's profile. And it was a, it was a video of him in the crowd at an R I Am Hardwell show doing a selfie and it was like Hardwell's playing my new song holy shit and I'd heard that song and I and I immediately you know downloaded the mix and I saw it said IDID and I didn't know what it was um, but I knew it was a Martin Garrix track and really really early on I think this is over a year ago um, I'd sent that into Universal and I said look this track is not only unbelievable no one knows about it, it's unreleased it's called Animals by Martin Garrix um, the kid's an absolute superstar he's got the look he's got the personality he's got the energy and we really got to do something about this. And at the time, we had just lost out on an opportunity because we waited too long. Um, the opportunity was a, it was a guy called Chris Malinchak, and the song was called So Good To Me, which is an artist that I found earlier as well. And I was like, look, like, we need to sign this right now. This is the next major hit. And you know, from there, right away, negotiations started, started. And luckily for me, one of, one of you know, my closest friends in music became his manager at the same exact time. So it's been an unbelievable experience working with him on marketing concepts and A&R concepts and being around the team. Um, and Casablanca was incredibly helpful for the development of Animals and plugging it to top 40 when, you know, instrumental tracks really weren't pushing the boundaries at that point. Um, so it, it was a really successful situation that I'm proud to have helped out in. So are you more of a scout or do you remain involved after the artist is signed as well? It's it's a difficult conversation. Um, you know, I I I'm hired as well a lot of the times as a marketing consultant and also as a publicist on the projects that I help bring in. Um, there, you know, we're talking about working on more A and R structured deals. But the thing is, I I'm remaining independent at the moment. Um, and being an independent consultant and having my own company, there are limitations. Um, although I'd like to I'd like to think that you know I have a, a little bit more of a role in power than a, than a typical consultant does because we've just been so involved in this project at a new label. Um, so we have been, you know, more involved in a lot of the remix opportunities for Seven Lines, the top lines, and, you know, for Martin Garrix, definitely helping out on some of the new projects. But um, as far as, like, being in-house in the studio every day, you know, there's, there's top A&Rs on those projects that are, that are handling those situations. Awesome. And before we let you go, Justin, I have one more question for you, which is about Las Vegas. Obviously, yeah. there's been a major boom there with electronic dance music over the last few years. Uh, the first major powerhouse really being, um, or one of the first major powerhouses being Marquee, which you were obviously a very uh, influential part of. Can you talk to us a little bit about what you do for Marquee and how you guys continue to remain relevant during with all the competition? Yeah. Um, I, I actually joined Marquee at a very funny point. It was when you know there there was a lot of competition about to enter the marketplace in Vegas. Um, for us at Marquee, you know, we try to focus on Marquee being um, known as you know one of the first nightclubs to bring electronic music into Vegas, but also known as Marquee and not as a nightclub who hosts Tiesto or Calvin Harris. We like to bring the name first and the talent second. Um, and that's kind of the way that I've always approached every initiative that we've done there is just focus on, you know, on the brand name and the music programming that we provide to the fans um, and less about who's performing there. And I think also now that we've had, you know, there has been a lot of competition. It's all about pushing the status quo, bringing in new music, telling the public why these new music is 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 the next big boom, whether it's Tech House with Jamie Jones or Deep House with Claude Von Stroke or Trance with, you know, Tritonal. It's just about pushing the boundaries and letting them know that we still remain existent. Um, and in, in between that, you know, obviously a lot of PR initiatives, but a lot, a lot of marketing stuff too. We like to focus on the artists and give them opportunities. Um, let them help out and feel more comfortable pushing Marquee as a force while we're helping them grow as an artist as well. 
Um, so I, you know, me personally, I like to work very closely with a lot of the artists and help grow their careers as well as positioning them next to Marquee. Um, and yeah, I mean, not to speak on too much specific stuff, but just making sure that Marquee stays the main focus and, you know, the music programming is second. Makes sense. Justin, thank you so much for joining us today on 20-something yeah, Live. I hope you continue to recover from your trip to Miami <laughs> and continue to bless you with the success that you've had because you've done a lot in a very short period of time. I think that our viewers are going to continue to hear about you and your artists. So thank you thank for joining you. us. I appreciate it, Jake. Thanks for having me. Of course. All right, guys. Our next guest, who is coming up right here in a second, um, he is an a &R over at Atlantic Records, where he's about to tell you about some of the artists that he signed already. He also is an a &R over at Warner Chapel Publishing Group. In addition to owning his own management company, which I mentioned some of his artists, Skizzy Mars and James Young, in addition to the alternative press breakout band currently on the cover of the magazine in my room, Issues. Let's welcome him now, my good friend Jeff Levin. Hello? We have Jeff. Hey, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> Not my thing. I got it. I got it fixed, though. We're good. What's no going worries, on, Jeff. Welcome to the show. How you doing? Good, good, good. Just ran out of a showcase to come visit, so I'm uh, I'm honored to be a part of the show. Thank you, Jay. Yeah, of course. We're so glad to have you. So talk to us about what's going on with you, Jeff. I always know you have a million things going on, and I'd love to hear from you so you can explain to our audience how you balance so many amazing things in different positions at different companies while still being an entrepreneur yourself. Um, I get asked all the time, you know, in every meeting, the kind of the joke seems <laughs> to be, you know, what hat are you wearing? And, you know, when I'm taking meetings. And the way I'm able to balance all these jobs and uh, uh, keep a strong perspective on what, I, what it is exactly that I do is that my job is primarily creative focus. So everything I do primarily has that focus on songwriting and actually artist development. So if I'm bouncing around from managing an act to a and an album at a record label to publishing an artist. Um, it's all the same job, essentially. And what I do in, able to, in order to balance everything is I have teams around me that support me on the creative side on every single asset and every single company. Now, the blessing is that, you know, when I'm doing meetings, a lot of the times, you know, um, I, I come from the most unbiased point of view. As someone would say, like, you know, there's too many conflicts involved in what you do in able you're a publisher, you're a label representative, and you're a manager. It's actually not true. Because what I'm able to do when I'm sitting with artists is a lot of times I'll be like, I'm not the right guy to manage you, but I want to be involved so bad that I, on the creative level that we should talk about a publishing deal. Or, you know, are the people we have at Warner Chapel could work so well with what you're doing creatively and how you're progressing in your career. Or, you know what, this is the right move to sign to Atlantic Records because you need radio right now and you need the right development and you need the right promo and you need a magnifying glass to magnify what you're doing. Um, so a lot of it has to come, it always comes down to when I'm meeting with an artist, what stage of the career they're at and what I'm good at mostly and what my team is good at and what, you know, what position would be best for me in the artist's career or I say, you know what, I'm, I'm not right for you on any level. I can't really bring much to you to, to the table, you know. The worst thing ever is a young um, a and guy or a creative person, I think, is to jump in on a project that you really can't be beneficial to, and then six months down the line, you're kind of stuck in this position where, you know, you have the artist signed. You know, some, some artists don't remember this, you know, that when you sign a contract with them and you get into business with them, you're just as much in business with them as they are with you, right? So six months down the line, if it's not working, I always tell the artist, you know, I'd rather not even do the contracts. I'd rather just find a position where we're both equally happy and, and continue to move forward. So I keep that focus and I keep that perspective really strong when I'm working with any artist. It doesn't matter whether it's publishing, management, or label. I keep the perspective mostly about the studio and, and recording and, and artist development and then the uh, and then I, I dabble in the strategic marketing, but I usually have my team who help me develop that side of it. So with creative focus at the forefront of everything you do, where exactly did you, Jeff, because you're how old, 25, 26? 25. 25. So at the age of 25 years old, how did you get the experience building songs? Um, I'm sure a lot of the viewers don't know, but you were the one that put together the BB Rex at Top Line over the Cash Cash record. 
You were also responsible for the session that came of Monster and then placing that with Eminem and Rihanna. Um, those are two top 40 records of the past year now and are, are huge successes, obviously. So where did you get that kind of experience and, and how did you get the trust of so many executives at these big companies at such a young age? Um, I think a lot of it had to start with where um, I began, which was, um, I think that's when I was about 15, I started uh, promoting local shows in, in New Jersey, in North, in North Jersey. Um, and then I and then from promoting shows and a lot of bands coming through, I started finding acts that I really loved. And every act that would come through it, I would ask, "Do you have a manager?" You know. And every time I was given this new opportunity to do something in music, I would go to Barnes and Noble and just try to find and 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 read about what it is that are you know. It kind of like the whole fake it till you make it strategy, but it's like a 15 year old. But the idea was that if if I was given an opportunity, I always wanted to be able to accomplish it. So I always would research and study and and build and 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 talk to people and try to accomplish any goals that were set forth to me. But in order, in, in terms of the record making process and actually building songs, I credit that to um, when I was uh, 16, when I was 17, I, I got hired to uh, by the company called Pure Tone Music. And it was me and just one other guy named Pete Gambarg. And the two of us um, had worked on about eight major label albums at the time as a &R consultants. And majority of them were American Idol records, including Chris Daughtry, Taylor Hicks, uh, Kelly Clarkson, um, and so on and so forth. I mean, we worked Blake Lewis. We worked on. I mean, you were doing this at the age of sixteen with him. Yeah, but it was basically just me on the floor with headphones. It wasn't really a real office. It was just me and him <laughs> just hanging out. And, and and you know, because American Idol was so popular at the time, and and those albums were selling so much, we would get thousands and thousands of songs in every every single day. And because of the pressure of delivering a record, I remember I remember we used to have to watch the final ten uh, on a. TV and uh, uh, Clive Davis would you know would point at the TV and say like, you know that one that one that one that one you know we'd start making records and um, you know basically it was my job to just dive through all the demos and I would have folders on my iTunes you know Chris Daughtry and Kelly Clarkson you know do these work for these artists um, and then kind of building out these playlists over the for, over the month and you know while the show was ending and being able to say you know oh my god I love this song but the lyric in this chorus you know isn't right for Daughtry but let's change this and let's structure this and the pressure of having to deliver it so quickly was uh, I credit to, to how I'm able to build songs so uh, uh, fast um, in this, you know especially in a business where um, you know you're getting so many song submissions at one given time it's it's more about remaining focused on a vision because you can get lost you know you, you listen to one song on a Tuesday and you say oh my god this would be so great for Iconopop and then you uh, and then you know the, the next day a song comes in you say oh my god this is so you know be great for so for Cody Simpson you forget about the I kind of pop song right so the idea is to just you know be able to look at every song um, as you know every time I hear a song that's incredible I think you know I think millions and millions and millions of dollars that's how I stay focused on it I say if if this if I, I if take out this vision for this song and I build it out and I successfully finish this this song can make my career. And if I stay focused on each individual song and not try to spread myself so thin, I'm able to deliver more quality songs. Wow. But, I, you know, but, but going back to it, I really credit the American Idol process to, to how I was able to deliver those records. Well, 20-something live oftentimes is about how do you get through the door. But I guess in your case, we want to know how you got on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> um, so stupid. Um, the idea... <laughs> the idea... Um, uh, I got lucky, uh, to be 100% honest. Um, I mean, I was making I was making noise locally in New Jersey for sure. Um, but what really happened was there was a guy uh, um, uh, on my football team when I was a freshman in high school. This is when I worked out, and I uh, he he wanted to invest in my management company. I had a few acts that were on Warped Tour, and everyone was seemed to be kind of progressing really well. And it At started the age of 16. Yeah, it started turning into a nice business. It wasn't like a really functional business, but it was a it was a business nonetheless. And I was just kind of learning as I was going. We had like a few acts on Warped Tour every year, and like things were starting to progress and move. And um, a friend of mine had loved had loved to the acts, and he his father had given him money to invest in a company, and he wanted to invest in my company. And he kept begging, and I said, "There's no reason to do it." And then it came up that I actually needed an extra five thousand dollars to print up uh, some distribution for 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 one of my artists, and um, um, so his father had called me and he said, hey, you know, I really want to give you this money. You know, I, I think this is a great idea. I really love your artist as well. And so we did a deal where I gave him a small percentage of the company for an exchange amount of whatever, $10,000. And what had ha nothing really had happened with the artist uh, on a bigger scale. And 
he made is he ended up making his money back, but not in a profitable way whatsoever. But what had come from that was, uh, you know, his father was actually a com an, oddly enough a computer technician, and he was a PC computer technician for a guy named Pete Gambar who ran Pure Tone Music. And the two acts that he loved, he gave the two acts to Pete, and he said, "Hey, can you listen to them?" And Pete uh, said, "You know, I really hate about 99% of everything I hear, but I'll listen to it when I get a second. Anyway, two months go by. He listens to the songs. He says, you know, he brings over the uh, my friend over back to his um, to his house to meet him. Uh, he quickly realizes that it wasn't him behind the artist creatively, and it wasn't him behind the artist on a business level. So he said, you know, can you bring over your friend Jeff, which was me. I went over, and he ended up hiring me as an intern. Uh, and then and then while I was an intern, he was interviewing people for an A&R manager position. Uh, to help out with all these albums because he was getting so many requests in uh, uh, every month uh, to work on these records, and he ended up not finding anyone he liked, so he just hired me, and that was kind of how it ended up <laughs> turning into that. So every every day you after high school, must have been a punk at the age of sixteen. I can only imagine. Oh, uh, my parents had no idea what I was doing. Really? <laughs> and, and you know, it's funny because they was, didn't know, you know they didn't know that you had that job. Uh, they didn't really understand what it was. It was kind of tough to explain it, you know. It wasn't really the easiest thing to understand, like, hey, I'm making all these major label albums. and um, But it was funny because we would all watch American Idol, and it was such a popular show. And um, I would know, I would be working on these people's albums while we were watching it, and I just wouldn't talk about it. I didn't really care. And, you know, um, but I would, the, but what my, uh, part of my, I, I had to do an independent study for my high school uh, work study program in order to graduate on time because I was working for this company full time and so I leave every day at 10:30 and one part of uh, what I had to do is include my the students and in involve involve them in the process of what I do for you know this company and I used to bring in test songs and I would do fake test uh, uh, studies off of, the, of you know over over Chris Daughtry demos and stuff like that and which I shouldn't have been doing which was a really bad idea but all these kids were hearing all these American Idol songs before they were even recorded by the artists <laughs> and they would, you know they would call me and be like I just heard that song I think it's that song but I'm not really 100 percent sure because you played it in class um, um, but you know I'd also remember I was just kind of thrown into this and I went from zero to sixty I think in a matter of you know you know six months and I was so, you know I was so overwhelmed by the process that I didn't. I almost didn't even think it was real. I just kind of like went with it and said, "Eh, hey, you know, hopefully this turns into something." And you knew that this was what you wanted to do, even at that young age. Oh yeah. I mean, I didn't really even know what A and R was when I got the job. To be honest, I was just, you know, I just had read about it. Um, but this is the most gruesome form of A and R, and you can imagine. Um, and um, um, but I mean, I think I thank God that I did it at the age that I did it because it was great. It was such a great introduction. It was such a. It was the. It is the prime example of what boot camp A and R is. I think those terms are thrown around a lot. A and R publishing, and I'm sure a lot of our viewers, you know, who aren't familiar with some of you know music 101, uh, would be more interested in getting a little bit more of definition on what an A and R does, and then also on the other end, what an actual publishing company can do for an artist. Um, you know what? I, I always tell people to always sign with the person and not the company. And uh, that go to what you just had said. That kind of goes perfectly because at the end of the day, everyone in this business—entrepreneur, manager, A and R, publisher, whatever you want to call them—the um, the term is so loosely defined. It, it, you know, it's funny. I, I really do believe in ten years that like all these titles will be completely different because there's really no specific thing you can do. You know, there's no specific attribute that somebody has that's that, that makes them an A&R. In my opinion, every single person is more and more becoming an individual, and the lines are being completely blurred. I'll, you know, I'll never forget the reason why I became a manager both uh, on a bigger scale, and I remember doing this deal with Warner on the management side. I remember because I was in an A&R meeting, and somebody had, um, you know, I, I, was, I was choosing my single for my artist on the label, and um, my boss had said, yeah, you know, it's great that you want that, but at the end of the day, you know, the manager wants this. And I said, so the manager wants that, and I want this, and so the manager wins, so he's the one really with the say. <laughs> so I kind of want, I want to be that guy. I kept saying in the meeting, I want, I want to be, I want to be him. I want to be the guy that makes the real decisions, you know. And so I really, you know, it, it, it sounds corny, but it's like, you know, my journey to becoming all these positions really started with me just going, I want to know the truth, you know what I mean? I want to be able to make decisions and actually, you know, and, and actually get shit done. Because in this business, it, it, as you know, it's tough to get things done, you know. To actually foresee a vision is tough when your vision has 45 other people that also make decisions and also have visions, you know. 
Um, so I wanted to be there. That from I wanted to be there at the riskiest part of an artist's career at day one, and be able to see it out onto the main stage. You know, and that was really my goal. And uh, the, the, to be able to do that, you have to be you know to be an, to be a successful A and R guy at a label, you have to be able to understand your part in someone else's vision. That's the reality. You have what, to what are those parts specifically, though, an A&R and a publisher for an artist? Well, I mean, essentially an A&R to label and a pu an a and publisher, at least a really good A&R to publisher, can essentially do the same thing. Um, you know, an A&R guy at a major label can do, like, what I did with, like, Take Me Home, or, um, or they can sign an artist and help build that vision with the manager on the creative side. You know, I ain't a girl named Melanie Martinez right now, and the manager is this guy, Ron Shapiro, who's fantastic. And I love his vision for Melanie. And I think on a, on, on a promo creative level, he's a genius when it comes to that stuff. And so it's really my job to hang out with her and talk to her every day purely on a creative level and just be able to find the right partners in the studio and like the right producers and the right co-writers and the right environment for her to live in and the right uh, play, you know, just, just purely on a creative level because that's where my expertise really lie and as an a and guy at Atlantic Records it's my job to make sure that the artist can foresee the creative vision and I'm not really there to, to, to comment on Ron's full-on creative vision on the marketing side and who she is as a brand. It's my job to complement the brand with the right music. And so that being said, I don't try to budge in on his full creative vision because it's really not my job at Atlantic to do that. It's my job to deliver the right songs for this company A to work and for B, for Melanie and Ron to be excited to be able to work in on their end as well. You know, I'm a piece of the puzzle. I'm not the guy with the, you know, the puzzle book. Um, yes. And then, you know, an A&R guy at a publishing company could be a partner to a project. What know? about just a publisher in general? I think publishing is a term that's thrown out a lot that a lot of young people don't necessarily understand what publishing really means. Well, I, I honestly think that those lines are blurred. You know, when I came into Warner Chapel, it um, was at the same time John Platt came in, and I remember he gave this great speech, and that we're going to sign what we love, you know, and not just what we think will work, but things that we, we genuinely love and want to sign and things that we could stand behind through good and through bad, right? Because if you don't sign something that you truly love in the bad times, it's tough to stand behind it. It's not easy to stand behind something you actually don't love and you just did purely on a business point, you know, standpoint. A publisher's lines are completely blurred. You know, um, for instance, uh, you know, I do a lot of the deals that come over from Atlantic to Warner Chapel and just in between. So I'm running a lot of point. I'm running point on a lot of those deals in general, just to make sure that we're building a Warner Music Group profile a, 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 as a whole. And then the other side of me is is signing writers and producers and, and and building brands for writers and producers to get them in the right rooms to develop their careers as uh, pop producers, urban producers, or whatever, and just making sure that they're 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 building in their own territories and making sure that their brand is just as successful as their records. Cool. Jeff, for those that don't know, you manage an indie pop male solo artist by the name of James Young that was on tour with London Grammar throughout the UK. You manage a really hot young rapper by the name of Skizzy Mars. You also manage one of the most talked about names on the Warp Tour this past year that will be selling out venues across the country over the next year and hopefully globally as well by the name of Issues. Mm -hmm. And Jordan Grammer out there wants to know, how do you manage such a diverse roster, i.e. branding solutions, for a rapper versus a male solo artist that's making pop music? That's a great question. I mean, I try to keep, you know, it's funny, I, I built this management company around the idea of, of, of proving that, the, you know, the music is everything and that, you know, I don't want to be stuck in one different genre. And to start a management company, you know, uh, I wanted to separate the genres as much as possible um, because I really wanted artists to feel like they were owning their own category in our company. And I wanted them to feel like, you know, I am the only rapper at this company, and that is, you know, in primary, and our primary focus is to be able to, to, you know, to develop him as a rapper and develop his career as a rapper and, 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 and to be able to transcend that. But it's also at the same time, I feel like genres are blurring more than ever. And if, you know, it, and it all really comes down to songwriting. I mean, Issues was built around just incredible pop songs and, and the idea that you can build a rock band with just great songs and win, you know, and come out of nowhere. That was a concept we came up with, came up with maybe a year and a half ago with, the, with our lead singer, Tyler Carter. Um, he was in the middle of making his whole album with Black Bear and Mike Posner decided to start a rock band overnight, you know. 
um, you know, Skizzy Mars is a, is a, is one of our is our you know is an incredibly young rapper. It's only existed for about two years. Has had two mixtapes come out. Just turned twenty years old and is a um, young, exciting writer. And the idea for me creatively right now is you know what where is his viewpoint? Skizzy Mars is not the the rapper you put on BET and ask to freestyle, but goddamn it, I'm going to make him the best songwriter in the in the rap game right now. And so I develop him as a songwriter so that those skills will overcome. Uh, um, or overshadow uh, the idea of him being the traditional rapper, kind of setting him apart into the more hype machine blog world. James Young and and, and uh, um, James Young, same idea, you know, just trying to build an, an incredible alternative artist with a vision. And it really comes down to the idea of of selecting these artists based on just believing in what they what they say, a and b, just on a creative level, knowing that they're an exciting force in, in, in music and just, you know, are focused on the creative aspect. I tell every one of my artists, I said, focus all your time on making music because the rest can come from that. If you if you if you have a beautiful vision and, and you're able to to focus your time on in the studio and always deliver records, you can always find ways to develop the artist from there. Um, Talk to us a little bit about the partnership between issues and rise records. I thought that was really interesting, the way that you put that together um, to establish their credibility, and I've had a lot of success in finding a key influencer, whether it's an individual person or a company that has a lot of clout in a certain lane that we're trying to penetrate um, with our artists, and, and how that can overnight sort of make them into a force to be reckoned with. Um, well, the idea. This is an interesting story. I mean, that Tyler was brought to my uh, business partner Joseph um, as a pop artist. And said, "Hey, you and Jeff seem to be really developing a really great lane for some, you know, crossover type artist. We don't really necessarily know what to do with him, um, and we think that you would be great with him." Ironically enough, he ended up be starting a rock band that worked perfectly within the Rise family, um, which was on a, honestly a blessing. Did you know the Rise guys at that point? Uh, did we know the Rise? Uh, I'm sorry, why? Did you know the Rise guys at this point? At that point, or were you just sending them? Yeah, music of course. They, yeah, they were the ones who brought it to us. Dave Shapiro, oh, okay. who ran wow. Velocity and Rise at the time, uh, who runs Velocity and Rise, who's also a major agent, wanted to take Tyler on as a as a solo artist as well and develop him in, in that career. Um, and the concept of issues was kind of built around that. And I think that this was Tyler's creative form of expression at the time. And we just, you know, and Joseph primarily believed in the vision and wanted to see it out. And I think that. The idea was just um, to develop them, uh, to develop Tyler as songwriters, and really focus. There was really no one else in the scene that was really focusing on great songs, and I think we took that opportunity to make sure that we were focusing on something that most other bands in that scene were in at the time. Hmm. Um, so you know, this is actually the first. This is the first act we have in this genre. So it was a huge success for Framework in their first year in the company. Cool. I'm not out there. Want to know? We're going to leave this as the last question. What advice do you have to somebody out there looking to get an A&R position at a major label directly out of college? Um, I think at this at the end of the day, you know, if you're finding the right artists and you're attaching yourself to the right names, you know, people are going to start talking about you because if 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 you're finding artists early, early artists will talk to anyone. You know, artists that are just coming out of the gate that don't know anyone, if you want to give them advice and you want to hang out with them and you want to help them creatively, and, and, and as long as you say something that's actually meaningful for them and not just push the hustle on them, you say, hey, by the way, like, if you just strip that guitar down a little bit, this song would just would blast so much better. Or, you know, the lyrics on this are incredible. Or just say something to them that's going to actually influence them. They're going to bring you onto their team. And I think a great way to come up now is coming up through the artist directly and being able to um, and being able to develop with the scene. And there's really no reason why you can't be an A&R right now. There's no reason why. It's the idea of just finding stuff early and being able to say, this is incredible and this is not, and this is why I love this and this is why I don't love this. And if you want to be an A&R guy, you cannot be passive. You cannot say, I'm not sure. I'm not gonna. It's like you either love something or you don't. And you should really be able to sit on one side or the other because at the end of the day, it's everyone's opinion. And you know, it, the idea is to have a strong opinion because you've got to be able to make decisions quickly. And without that opinion and that personality, you're going to be in a stalemate with your artist for years. So practice that now and being able to say, I love this and I don't love this. And turn down man. that guitar. Turn, yeah, exactly. Cool. Jeff, thank you so much for joining us. Congrats on all your success. I think that everybody's going to be seeing a lot more of your name attached to some amazing projects over the next couple of years. And it's been an honor to be your friend. 
and work with you. So thanks for joining us today on 20 Something Live. i will probably see you tonight, so uh, I'll talk good. soon. Okay. All right, guys, before we bring in our next guest, we're going to do our quick excerpt, the book of the week, Losing My Virginity by Richard Branson, one of the best branding extraordinaires of our era. And we will now move forward to a guy who releases a lot of music that probably lets kids use their virginity, lose their virginity, excuse me. Uh, it's one of the, the best blogs out there for discovering new music and breaking hits every day. Um, when they post your song, labels and other influencers reach out. They have a really great audience they've built over the past few years. He's become a great friend of mine, and some of you may know him as the CEO of a website by the name of Good Music All Day. So right now, I'd like to welcome my good friend Tim Weber onto the show. Tim, how you doing? There we go. I'm doing there well. There he is. Hey, yo. How you doing today, man? Appreciate you getting me on. I just want to say thanks to uh, Justin and Jeff. They killed it, too. Great advice. You got a great cast here today. Thanks so much for joining us, Tim. Hell yeah, appreciate it. So where are you at right now? You're in Nashville? I am in Nashville, yep. I actually uh, had to leave the offices because the internet was getting a little sketchy at the offices. So <laughs> I figured I'd come home and make sure that we could have this run as smooth as possible. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. Yeah, no worries. Uh, so I think one of the cool things about you is most people that you know we work with or have on the show, they're either in Los Angeles or New York, but everybody watching might not be in a major city that in the music industry like Los Angeles or New York. So right. how do you do what you do out of Nashville, which obviously is a major city for country music, but um, you yeah. work in all sorts of different genres. So has that been a barrier to, for you, or has that been uh, actually somehow spun as a positive? Yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely a blessing and a curse. I mean, the biggest curse is by far the fact that you have to travel to New York and L.A. to take meetings <laughs> with the big-time labels and with uh, the main people that do have offices. But at the same time, the biggest blessing for me has been the idea that in Nashville, it's a lot easier to stick out. Um, in New York and L.A., there's a lot going on every single day, and you can get lost in the, in the hustle and bustle and clutter of everything. But in Nashville especially with the country music scene being as big as it is. It's very old-fashioned out of all the genres. The country music scene is one that's still seeing album sales. It's still very old-fashioned. So when you can come with something new and exciting and innovative, it's a lot easier to capture the attention of the people here in town. Um, and the other big thing is like press passes and getting to meet up with artists and getting to do what we do. It's a lot easier to connect with people when you're in a city like Nashville where you can go to Atlanta, you can go to Chicago, you can go to a couple other cities if you need to, but when they come through Nashville, you're not competing with thousands of other people to try to get 50 different photo passes. We can really make the most of the time while people come through Nashville. And at the end of the day, I mean, we don't have the weather of L.A., but we got better weather than New York, so I'm happy <laughs> about that. Cool. So talk to us about the origination of Good Music All Day and how you got started. Yeah, so uh, I got started. I started the blog when I was out at Notre Dame, um, and basically what happened was I had a lot of free time. I had just discovered the concept of free music and legally free music. Obviously, growing up, we all had Kazaa and some different outlets that we could illegally download music, but as I was in high school, I started coming across the Dat Piffs and some genre-specific blogs, and by the time I got to college, I felt like I wasn't the only college kid with a more eccentric taste in music that went outside of just one genre. And so I really tried to search around and try to find somewhere on the internet that had my taste in music. Um, and I couldn't find it, so I started the website and made it just for my friends in high school and for my close friends. And didn't think of it as this is something that I'm going to do for the rest of my life, more of I just wish there was something like this that exists. And I think due to the fact that it was so early on in the blog game and that we were doing something innovative by crossing the different genres, realizing that college kids like something different when they're studying versus when they're partying versus when they're driving, um, all different types of music. So why not get a website that's just showcasing the best free music in all those genres? And it was actually funny because it hit about 2,000 views a day, which isn't a lot when you think about where we are now. But it scared the hell out of me, so we actually shut down the website at that point. And I was like, man, I don't know like what I'm doing. I'm not a writer. I don't have great grammar. I don't, like, I, I don't want people to know me as this. But luckily I had some friends and some positive people around me that was like, it's just about the music at the end of the day. If you're a fan of it, keep it going. So I bought the URL, goodmusicallday.com, 
and pretty much from there it just started taking off pretty much exponentially um, and those first 18 months was unbelievable rapid growth and just trying to keep up with it. Well, I didn't even realize that uh, that commonality, the trait amongst all three of our guests today of starting businesses while they were still in school. So you were in high school and marketing to college kids at the time? Uh, I was in high school when I had basically discovered the concept of the free music. And then when I went to college was the first time that I wasn't with my close high school group of friends. And I felt like we were the ones that shared the most the most common taste in music. So when I left for college, that first semester of college was when I was started this personal blog just to share with my high school group of friends to say, here's what I'm listening to while I'm at college. So I was 18 years old, a freshman in college when I started this. Um, and after the first year, it had taken off enough that I kind of realized this could be a gateway into the music industry. So I left Notre Dame and went to NYU thinking, hey, maybe I'll get a job at a record label or do something cool like that. And while at NYU, I had the, the head of the program of the Clive Davis School of Recorded Music out there, Jeff Rabhan, tell me to drop out of school. He basically said, you either do something you love and you do it all the way, or you don't do it at all and you really focus on school, but there's no half-ass in two things. Um, and so I really took that to heart, and I was like, well, I really believe in what I'm doing and my taste in music, and I'm seeing results, um, so what's the next step? And then I actually transferred schools again and went to Belmont and started up the actual LLC um, before taking a break from school to really focus on this full time. Makes sense. Jay Duham out there wants to know, Tim, outside of providing great music, how do you keep the blog fresh and thriving? Yeah, and I think that that's, it comes from a combination of different things. I think one of them is inspiration from other blogs. For bloggers to say that you're not checking 25, 50 other blogs every day um, is crazy. And there's always things that other blogs are doing that's great and innovative and you can pull from. But at the same time, you have to be able to separate yourself from the blog and think, what would I want if I was the listener? Like, I don't have time to come to this site every day. My job's not blogging what can I do as a blogger myself to be more appealing to that fan and so in our layout we took that as well we just need to clear make it when you come to the site there's a song of the day there's a mixtape of the day there's a video of the day so if you don't have time to come and scroll through all of our content at least you have something to be able to see um, and from there it's literally just brainstorming surrounding yourself with people taking all feedback the, the positive and the negative um, you learn and you live so we've definitely done implemented some changes on GMAD that have that have gone south, um, and we've implemented some that have that have turned out to be a really really good perk for us. Um, but at the end of the day, it's really trial and error, pulling from the people that inspire you, and uh, and trying to stick true to your gut. At the end of the day, I mean that's all you have is your name and your brand that you're establishing. Um, I think there's very few bloggers out there that don't look at their blog as a stepping stone, even as they try and grow it to accomplishing other things and I would never have anybody on the show that was solely a blogger unless that blog was doing something really really unique. You've obviously started to expand, you guys are throwing your own tours, you're doing some consulting on the side for Wyclef. Talk to us about some of those other things that you've started to engage with and where you see your career headed. Yeah, so uh, it is tough because at the end of the day a blog can be a great way to make a little bit of money but it's never going to turn into a business just with advertising revenue. At the end of the day it doesn't matter how many page views you get unless you're competing with the Vices and, and some of these Rolling Stones and the big blogs. Um, you're never really going to be able to turn it into a business just with advertising revenue. So I didn't really realize that the first two or three years I was seeing this growth and thought hey this is this is going to be it I'm just going to keep doing this um, and then kind of as it kept growing I started getting some offers myself people realizing that I understood my demographic the college market better than most of the other people that were blogging at the time and so for when Wyclef reached out they actually the first time they reached out was about an artist named Chris Cab who was one of the first ones that they had signed and they literally just sent me an email about two years ago that said, you know, we noticed this guy, we found him on your website, we're going to be monitoring your website for the next year or so, like, just good job in doing what you're doing. And then a year later, um, reaching out and being like, well, you're obviously onto something really good, we've seen multiple artists blow up, how do we get you involved in what we're doing and give you to kind of give your feedback directly to us so that way we can implement it with our artists and our vision. Um, and so... 
the, the nice part with GMAT is I do envision the company and the Good Music All Day name being something that I stick with. Um, we have a lot of different possible new revenue streams that are opening up. Um, the idea of touring is a big one with ticket sales and merch, um, artist consulting, and really just doing anything that fits into the upcoming artist phase of their career. I know listening to the speakers before me, it seems like a lot of people take passion in going from day one to the point when they're on that main stage at Ultra. And for us, it's more of we really want to focus on just that first 12 months of an artist's career when they do want to reach out and they'll take any advice they can get, really making sure they're getting the right advice and that they're understanding they don't need to sell out to be something big and get other people to buy into them. At the end of the day, if you can stick to your gut and just take criticism as it comes and say, yes, that's good, and no, I don't like that, then you'll be fine and get to a point where you can surround yourself with people that get your vision and will help you reach that next point. But we really like to focus in that 12, 18 months of a startup artist career. How do you decide what artists to get behind? Obviously, you guys get thousands of emails a day, submissions yeah, of records. Un unbelievable. You, what's the best yeah. way to get your attention? And how do you guys select which artists you really put your weight behind? Um, I mean, at the end of the day, it really does come down to our taste in music. I mean, that that's what the brand has been established on, is at the end of the day, does it feel right in my gut? Do I think um, that this music would resonate with a lot of people? And I think something that that gets misconstrued and gets a negative connotation to it is this idea of pop music. People think of pop music as being bad and really pop music as a genre all it means is that it's popular. You can have mm. pop hip hop, you can have pop whatever it just means if you're not a hip hop head and you hear a rap song it's like okay yeah I get that. I get why that's good. There's something that's universal about it and I think as an artist a lot of times people get really focused on either making super pop music that's just trying to relate to everyone or being super indie and being like, oh, I don't want my song on the radio. But there's a fine balance when you listen to a song of realizing that they have their own brand integrity already established, but they can also resonate with people outside of the lane that they're thinking they're in. And so for us, we like to see that kind of potential in an artist that's, yeah, you obviously need to develop your sound or your style or something, but you have that little it factor and if we can help tweak it and see how to make sure it reaches the maximum amount of people. And not every artist is going to end up being the Cruellas or being the Chance the Rappers or being these guys that explode huge, but not every artist wants to be that. Some artists don't mind playing in front of 500 people for 100 shows a year, and they count that as a win, and that's as pop as they're going to get. You recently asked me for a quote for your website as far as a testimonial. I obviously did so willingly as you've been such a great supporter of our okay. movement with Corella. Um, but you also had a quote that you'd already received from arguably the number one story of last year, which is Macklemore. Talk yep. about your relationship with Macklemore, how, does, how it started, and yep. why he would provide your website with the quote. Yeah, so uh, we started it back in 2009, and he released the Versus EP back in 2009, and I put it up on GMAD right the day that it came out, gave it a 9 out of 10 rating, said this guy is like speaking the truth, he's amazing, and I even think I put in the review, but he's not going to be mainstream successful because like the world's not ready for it. Like I gave it a 9 out of 10, I believed in it, but I didn't think he had songs that were going to be on the radio just yet. Um, but that was also when he was doing songs like Other Side, which is a very serious song, an American. Amazing record. Um, yeah, some really, really great records, but they didn't, he didn't quite have those radio hits. So reached out to him and his team back then, um, and I just formulated a contact. And then the first couple times I saw him live was actually in front of 50 people, probably 25 of which were his family. And it was like seeing that he's putting his heart and soul into this music, and he obviously is standing for something bigger than just success and to me the more I heard about his story and the idea that he idolized Lil Wayne and he wanted to be that rapper and then his old story of going through rehab and coming back out with a different message and wanting to influence the youth in a positive way it was just something I could get behind um, so in I think the late 2011 I met up with him again um, and we shot some videos and just uh, got to talk about kind of at that, that beginning point um, when he started 
when they started taking off. And it's interesting, Can't Hold Us was on the radio and charted last year multiple times, but that song's from 2011, if you go back. That's an old song that he just kind of got that distribution and radio push behind. But he had that content back then. 2012, did some interviews with him, started shooting some more live footage. The shows were getting bigger. And then last year, it escalated quicker than any artist that I've ever seen. And, and it's tough to be able to get a testimonial from him. I had to wait a week to be able to hear back and everything. But luckily, having that connection and name recognition with his manager and his team has been, has been crucial and allowed me to, to keep that relationship going. You mentioned that he spoke the truth. You think that's the and there's a lot of artists out there who speak the truth. What do you think it's been about Macklemore that's enabled him to shoot right out of here? I mean, just really be the biggest story, like you said of last year. Yeah, I think uh, I think he is a very genuine guy that shows his different sides, um, and obviously that's apparent when people would compare Thrift Shop and Same Love, two very different songs and mm. everything. But I think the difference is when you watch those, you don't think you're watching two different people. You think you're watching one fun-loving guy that really cares about the world. And at the end of the day, that is a message in all of his songs, is that he is a fun-loving guy, but he also wants to influence the people that are listening to his music in a, in a positive way. And he has songs about the idea of, yeah, he likes smoking weed, but he doesn't want to rap about smoking weed because he doesn't want kids smoking weed. So it's like... How do you balance that? And he puts it into words and says, I don't have the answers, but I know that I want to help people realize they're not the only ones struggling with these questions. So he's not trying to bullshit anyone and act like I'm the shit or act like I'm better than you or that I have the answers. It's more of I'm just a genuine person going through the same kind of things you are. Wow. And and do you, do you think that his – do you think that there's like other people that understand it exactly like – how do I explain it? Is it the audience out there? Is that what's allowed him to really build the call following is how genuine he is in that sense? Um, yeah, I would say a little bit. I would say it never it never seemed like he sold out or changed what he was doing just because the songs that he's been doing for the last six years have always kind of carried that same message. Um, it's really tough uh, to kind of be able to pinpoint what that exact one thing is. I think if I had just the one quick, this is the exact answer, I'd be a billionaire and, and <laughs> it'd be a different story. But uh, I do think at the end of the day, the other big thing for him was this idea that the way that fans discover artists most of the time is by typing their name into YouTube and checking out the first two videos that come up and watching the first 30 seconds of them and saying whether or not they can vibe with them. And Macklemore, back in 2009, 2010, was putting together videos that looked like million-dollar budgets that he was on a huge label, but really he was just partnering with other people that believed in his vision and allowed him to brand himself in a way that as people discovered him, they felt like they could relate to him. They felt like he was already at a level of professionalism that he didn't have to go back and take down videos from YouTube and start back over. He was mm -hmm. able to continually build step off step with the momentum that he was getting with each release. Content is everything. So you've been at the, the forefront of predicting Macklemore's success, even if you didn't know how mainstream was going to go. You obviously yeah. predicted Mayak Corella's success. Um, you've got the attention of, of industry connoisseurs like Wyclef for predicting these artists. So who can we look forward to seeing break in 2014 and 2015? What artists are you getting behind today? Yeah, uh, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, there's, a, there's a couple different ones, a um, variety of different levels that they're at right now. Obviously, I'm pretty big on Vic Mensa right now, which isn't a big surprise considering the fact that he's already been torn with Disclosure and J. Cole and, and doing the numbers that he is. But the whole Save Money movement, I really believe, will kind of be this year's what TDE and some of the other groups were in the past. Um, I really think that like Save Money as a collective right now, if you don't know about them, every single individual in their group is extremely talented and complements each other. Um, I'm really big on some bands uh, here in Nashville, like uh, Coin is the name of a, a kind of poppier band. Uh, indie One is Daniel Allsworth and the Great Lakes. Um, they're kind of more indie pop. They're great. Um, and then on kind of the rap side, I'm really big on a guy named Futuristic right now that's coming out of Arizona. Um, he's been doing some touring with Hobson and Dizzy Wright and some of those kind of guys and building his own following. Um, and then 
I mean, it's kind of it's kind of up in the air right now um, about some of the other guys, but yeah, I'd love to name drop some more, but I know I'm gonna leave out some of the some of the bigger ones. <laughs> all good, Tim. Thank you so much for joining us. Congrats on all your success. And I guess if we want to leave with one note, you want to talk just a little bit about the tour? Yeah, uh, it's a great uh, great learning experience. So basically, we had had this vision. Um, of doing a GMAD tour, uh, we had been sponsoring a bunch for a while and kind of saying instead of sponsoring, that seems to be the revenue stream in the music industry, so we need to get involved. Um, and we did a bunch of dates in this semester with Wicket the Instigator, um, and we just premiered his ZZ Top remix today, and the shows have been doing very well. I think we got ambitious with how much we thought we could do in-house with three people and at the end of the day it's kind of like what all these guys said is if you really believe in something you just have to do it and then you'll learn and live from it um, and while it wasn't necessarily the huge revenue stream that we thought it wasn't a failure and we are going to be able to know who to partner with and what we need um, in the future and the idea of being a conglomerate for the college kids that at the end of the day colleges have venues between 500 people and 5,000 people that they're trying to fill and if we're targeting that audience there's no reason we shouldn't be the people providing the acts and providing the sponsors that are in front of them um, as tastemakers ourselves. Awesome. Well Tim, thanks for joining us and as always for your love and support. So great no, to have you on the show and congratulations on everything. Good music all day. Hey, thank you very much for having me Jake. No problem. Guys, as we close out the fourth episode of 20-something live, I'd like to pick a song of the week. But this week, I'm going to make it an artist of the week. If you have not heard Kygo by now, that's K-Y-G-O. You need to go hear it because it's some of the most amazing music that's been put out in the past year. Very, very exciting group of remixes with, I'm sure, lots of great original music to come. Shout out to my boy Miles for putting that together. All right, guys. Thank you so much for joining us. I will see you next week.